I met a patient recently. Let's call him Andre. He walked into my clinic with a sense of pride that I honestly respected. He said, Doc, you're gonna be proud of me. I haven't touched a single opioid in almost eight months. I've been using cannabis instead, and I feel like I finally have some control. And I have to be honest, part of me wanted to high five him. Because getting off hydrocodone, oxycodone, all those powerful narcotics that have wrecked lives across this country, well, that's something worth celebrating. Andre was the kind of man who had that look in his eyes. That look of someone really trying to put his life back together. He said he stopped hanging with old friends who were still using. Started walking in the evenings with his niece just to get his head right. And his mood had lifted. He felt clear, hopeful, grounded. But then he paused and said, Doc, I heard something on the news about weed and diabetes. That can't be right, can it? And that's the moment I realized something important. A person can feel like they're winning one battle and still be completely unaware that another one might be forming right beneath them. Andre had taken a powerful step, moving away from narcotics. But like so many people, he assumed that because cannabis felt more natural, less synthetic, and honestly, more socially accepted now, that it was a clean swap with no metabolic strains attached. And that's exactly why this new study that just came out matters. Researchers looked at over 4 million people, let that number sink in, and compared more than 96,000 adults who used cannabis to millions who didn't. Over about five years, they saw something surprising. 2.2% of cannabis users developed type 2 diabetes compared to just 0.6% in those who didn't use it. When they crunched the numbers and accounted for other risk factors, that translated into almost a fourfold increased risk. Now, that doesn't mean cannabis directly causes diabetes. The study itself was clear. This is association, not definitive causation. And you know this channel definitely cares about that. But 4 million people is not a small database. And if you're someone like Andrew, someone who's trying really hard to move his life in a healthier direction, that's worth paying attention to. I looked back at Andre and asked him a question. When you use cannabis, do you notice changes in your appetite? He laughed immediately. Doc, when I get high, I can take down half a family-sized bag of chips without blinking. Then I grab a juice, then some cereal, basically whatever is sweet and crunchy. And that there is one of the metabolic traps. People don't just use cannabis. They pair it with ultra-processed snacks. THC, the compound that gives the high, activates CB1 receptors that ramp up appetite, change the way your body stores fat, and increase cravings for sugar. Now imagine doing that a few weeks a night, month after month. Add in stress, irregular sleep, maybe a little extra alcohol on the weekends, and you've got the perfect metabolic storm brewing quietly in the background. You don't wake up diabetic the next morning, but you begin to drift toward it. Andrew's face changed as we talked. That hopeful posture shifted into a quieter curiosity. My sister has diabetes, he said slowly, and my uncle lost part of his foot because of it. But I never thought this had anything to do with me. I don't even eat that much sugar unless I'm high. And even then, I don't think about it. And that's when it clicked. Most people who move toward diabetes aren't doing it on purpose. They're not reckless. They're misinformed. They think they're choosing the lesser of two evils. But no one told them there was a third thing to watch. Insulin resistance. Creeping in quietly while they're busy celebrating progress in another area. I told him something I tell all my patients. I'm not anti-cannabis. I'm pro-informed decision-making. If cannabis generally helped you avoid opioids, that's a big win. But if in the process is slowly nudging your metabolism towards diabetes, we should know that and build a strategy to protect you. For a moment, he just sat there silently. Then he said something powerful. Doc, my little nephew watches me. He thinks I'm the strong one. I don't want to be the guy who beats addiction only to end up losing my health somewhere else. That statement right there is why I'm making this video. Because someone out there has made real strides. Maybe it's you. Maybe you've reduced your pain meds. Maybe you're calmer. Maybe your anxiety's down. And good, truly. But you deserve to know the whole picture. 
That same study that celebrated reduced opioid use by some cannabis users also raised a red flag. Almost a fourfold increase in diabetes risk in young to middle-aged adults who use cannabis compared to those who don't. Now, this was presented at a major scientific conference. It still needs a peer review and follow-up research. There are limitations. But it was strong enough to make headlines and strong enough to start a conversation like this. As Andrew and I kept talking, he brought up his cousin who uses cannabis heavily and recently gained weight around his midsection. And he jokes about his weed belly, Andrew said. And I asked him if anyone had checked his cousin's fasting insulin, his triglycerides, his liver enzymes. He shook his head. That's another thing. Most people still think diabetes is just about sugar, not realizing that it's really about insulin, liver fat, inflammation, and the slow loss of metabolic flexibility. This is where I challenge you directly. If you or someone you love uses cannabis, especially regularly, and especially if it's paired with snack food, late night eating, or emotional coping, don't just assume it's harmless because it doesn't feel as dangerous as opioids. Metabolically, the body doesn't care about social perception. It only cares about biochemical impact. Andre left that visit with something more powerful than fear. He left with a plan. He didn't stop using cannabis overnight. Instead, we made shifts. He started using it earlier in the day instead of late at night. He ate protein before using so his appetite spike didn't hit an empty stomach. He swapped processed snacks for zero sugar options. Over time, he even experimented with CBT dominant options to see if it could reduce THC exposure without increasing pain. And most importantly, he got curious about his labs. He said, Doc, if I'm going to do this, I want to see what it's doing. And that, to me, is the energy we need. Not fear. Curiosity. Ownership. If cannabis helps someone step away from opioids, that's worth applauding. But stepping into metabolic disease unknowingly is not a price anyone should have to pay. Opioids steal lives quickly. Diabetes steals them slowly. One burns the house down. The other rots the foundation quietly while you sleep. As we wrap this up, Imagine Andre going home after that visit. He walks into the kitchen. His nephew is there doing homework. Andre looks at the pantry differently this time. He doesn't just see chips. He sees insulin. He doesn't just see candy. He sees his uncle's foot. He doesn't stop being proud of his progress. He simply broadens his awareness. And that's what I want for you. Cannabis is not evil. Sugar is not evil. Even opioids aren't evil. There are tools that can become traps. What matters is awareness, timing, dose, and the metabolic terrain you're building beneath your feet. If you choose to use cannabis, do it with your eyes wide open. Understand your body signals, track your labs, protect your liver, guard your insulin like your life depends on it, because in many ways it does. And if this opens your eyes even a little, stay with me. We're going to keep learning together. Because the more you understand your metabolism, the more power you hold over your health story. I'll see you in the next video.